should say that uh, at first when I was uh, invited to give this uh, presentation, I felt a bit uneasy because I felt that perhaps I would be the outlier in, uh, in, this, uh, in this field since I'm not really working in a multi-criteria decision aid and I'm not really working in preference learning. So I was wondering what am I doing here? So perhaps the fact that I'm not working in either of these two fields made me uh, a good candidate. I was asked to speak specifically of um, the use of Boolean techniques, the use of Boolean functions and methods in learning or in classification. And uh, Andrea and I suggested that perhaps we could link or somehow synchronize our two presentations. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to present a very, very superficial presentation. I was not extremely aware or well aware of uh, how much background this uh, public has about uh, Boolean functions, about classification techniques. So it, to some of you it may seem extremely introductory and, uh, and I apologize in advance in that case, but I would like to give you at least the flavor of what has been going on in this field for uh, 25 years now. And this afternoon Andre Boros will present a talk on a much more specific and more technical topic on a learning uh, monotone functions. So this is for the warning. So I'm, I'm going to start with a short introduction of uh, Boolean functions. Um, tell you what is learning from examples, but we've had a, an introduction to this topic by Eike this morning already, so I will, there will be a, a little bit of overlap between the two talks. And then I will turn to partially defined Boolean functions and to this field of, a, of a application or this, perhaps I should say, this bag of tools that we call a logical analysis of data. <coughs> so let me start with Boolean functions. I, I, I like when I speak of Boolean functions to start with this uh, slide of introduction. We have all learned about functions when we were in, uh, in school. And, um, and if you think of what a function is, well, it's a, an object like this this one, it's an object like this, and if you think of what uh, properties a function should have in order to be interesting, then you may come up with the conclusion that each of the variables of the function should take at least two distinct values, because otherwise it's not really a variable somehow, and the output of the function or the value of the function should take at least two distinct values, because otherwise it's just a constant function, which is not uh, extremely exciting. So. If you restrict yourself to functions where each variable has exactly two, pos each variable takes exactly two possible values and the function takes exactly two, two possible values, then you end up with a class of functions which are in a sense the simplest functions you can think of, which are called Boolean functions after George Boole. So these are the objects we are interested in and, and again from the point of view of mathematics, let's say, in a sense, these are extremely, extremely simple objects. Yeah, the simplest functions you can think of. And um, this is a type of illustration I will use in my talk at uh, a few occasions. So you can view uh, a Boolean functions as a valuation of the unit hypercube. Yeah? So if you look at all the values that the variables can take and look at these as being embedded in the Euclidean space, let's say, then you get points of the form 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. And the Boolean function is just giving a color or a valuation or a yes, no value to each of the points. So red points, blue points, just as in the previous talk. So this is what the Boolean function looks like, a valuation of the vertices of the, <coughs> unit, of the unit hypercube. Now, these functions are, again, extremely simple and it may be surprising that there is a rich theory of Boolean functions, such simple objects, and that there is a, a rich array of applications as well of Boolean functions. Well, actually, if you think of it, perhaps there are so many applications because they are so simple somehow. So the fact that these functions are basic objects explain that they pop up, they come up in, in all kinds of fields, in all kinds of models. and. Uh, well, Boole was interested in, uh, in modeling human reasoning, as, uh, as you probably know, and where the inputs, outputs are just true-false uh, variables. 
Um, Boolean functions have been studied a lot in electrical and uh, engineering. Uh, in electronic engineering, where well, you can model networks as a being, you know, gates which are open or closed, and you get a, a yes or no positive or negative signal at the end of the network. Computer science, it's a Boolean functions are a basic model of computation somehow. Um, in game theory and uh, social choice, many of you may be interested in these uh, fields. A simple game in game theory is nothing but a special type of Boolean functions, monotone Boolean functions, let's say. And I could go on and on. Artificial intelligence, which is more or less what I will be talking about. In artificial intelligence, you may look at uh, an action being taken yes or no and resulting in, a, in an output or a, as an end result yes or no. And uh, this, again, in some cases can be modeled by a Boolean function. And uh, in reliability, the fact that the system is failing or not due to the failure of some of the parts can be, again, the most basic model of a, of a reliable system can, is, a, is a Boolean function, in fact. So there are thousands and thousands of publications on, uh, on related topics. And Mark was mentioning, this is my promotion uh, slide, uh, that we have recently written a book on, on Boolean functions. What is interesting about this book, perhaps, is that it's uh, 700 pages long. It's a monograph which introduces some of the basic aspects of, uh, of Boolean functions. I highly recommend it. And, uh, and in fact, we have a second book. Uh, which is a, a collection of edited surveys on, again, many applications of Boolean functions in computer science, engineering, and mathematics. And this one is 780 pages long. So the total of these two books is 1,500 pages, and it is far from covering the field. Uh, so this somehow shows the richness of, uh, of this uh, field of uh, Boolean models and applications. And what I want to do today is focus on one special type of models only. So let me just set up some of the terminology and notations and so on. So I will be interested in Boolean functions on n variables. So I have n Boolean variables. The function takes value 0 or 1. And I will denote by t of f the set of true points or true vectors of the function, meaning the points where it takes value 1. And false vectors are the set of false vectors is denoted as, uh, as f of f, and this is the set of points where the function takes value 0. And well, in general, I will come back to this. While these two sets, well, not in general, for a Boolean function, these two sets are disjoint, and they cover the whole Boolean cube, yeah. obviously. Now, a term is, is, if you want, simply an elementary conjunction. So I will be using terms a lot in this, uh, in this presentation. So it's a conjunction of Boolean variables and their negations, complements. So x bar is 1 minus x. And it's a conjunction which does not necessarily involve all the variables. In general, it does not involve all the variables. And you can look at a term like this as saying that, well, as reflecting the fact that some of the variables should take value 1. Variables in P, positive, should take value 1. Variables in N, negative, should take value 0 for this term to take value 1. Yeah. So the term takes value 1 if a certain condition on the values of the variables is satisfied. <coughs> so this is one simple interpretation of a term. And if you look at this geometrically again, the set of true points associated with a term is a face or a subcube of the unit hypercube. So this is a small example. If you look at, um, at this face of the cube, you can look at it as being the set of true points of this simple term, x bar 2, meaning that these are all the terms, well, these are all the points, sorry, where the second variable x2 takes value 0. And I could look at a different term like this one. This green edge here is a subcube. It's a face of the cube. And it is the set of all the points where variables 2 and 3, in this case, take value 1. Okay. So each term is a cube, a subcube. Each subcube is a term. Now, 
every Boolean function, this is a well-known fact, every Boolean function can be represented as an or, a disjunction of terms. Yeah. This is called a disjunctive normal form. Computer scientists look very much, uh, like very much to look at conjunctive normal forms, but it's, these are dual to each other. We like disjunction of terms. So an, a disjunctive normal form is a disjunction over a certain number of elementary conjunctions of elementary conjunctions of the type I showed before. And um, this DNF is going to take value one if at least one of the terms takes value one, meaning if at least one of the conditions on the variables is, is satisfied. Geometrically, you can think of the disjunctive normal form as giving a covering of the true points by subcubes. So this is a disjunctive normal form which says that the true points of this function are covered by this cube and by this cube. Fine, so these are elementary facts. Let me turn to learning from examples and here I'm going to rely on a, or I'm going to cover some of the material that Ike was covering this morning with slides which are much nicer than mine. But uh, uh, so basically, Ike was showing the same type of picture. I'm going to assume in learning from examples that you have a data set, which in my case will be binary in the sense that I have blue points and green points, uh, blue points and red points, which are given. And the goal of the classification exercise, let's say, is to find, just as in the previous slides, is to find a rule which is separating the red points from the blue points. I'm going to do this in a deterministic setting today. So the goal or the objective of the exercise eventually is to be able to answer questions about new points arriving, which we have not seen before. So if you present me with a point like this one and you ask me, should it be red or blue? I'm just going to apply the rule, the classifier, the rule that I've determined before. And I will say in this case, well, this point is sitting to the left of the green line, and so it should be blue. Yeah. So that's how the learning from example is working in a, in a general setting. It's used again in many, many kinds of uh, application fields, in, in marketing, in, uh, in medical applications. I will use this type of examples as illustrative examples. In, uh, one of the jobs of a medical doctor is to determine on the basis of symptoms, let's say, that have been observed in a patient, to determine whether uh, uh, the patient has or does not have a certain disease, for instance. Yeah. So the doctor looks at certain attributes, which could be the results of medical tests, which could be all kinds of, uh, of symptoms, fever or not, I don't know. And on this basis, he has to decide, well, is this patient suffering from a certain illness? So this is a sort of classification, classification exercise. Well, not everything can be learned from, uh, from examples. So clearly, you have to assume that there is some sort of ground truth, perhaps as, a, as, a, as it was told this morning, which explains that uh, somehow you can derive some fixed rules which apply to all the examples you will see in the future. <coughs> so formal setting, general setting, um, we have a number of attributes which take values in certain domains, each of them. We have a data set, which is the set of examples we have seen so far. And I'm going to assume that this set is static in this presentation. So I have a, a set which is a set of uh, uh, observations of the attributes on, uh, for different, uh, different examples. And I have a class which is assigned to each point in the data set. So each point in the data set is classified or receives a label if you want C1, C2, Cs. And the job of the classifier, of the human classifier somehow, or, or of the algorithmic classifier, is to find the general rule which associates with any point in the domain, associates one of the labels, associates one of the class, one of the classes. And usually we expect, and again, that's what I'm going to assume in this talk, we usually expect that at least the classification or the classifier should coincide 
should be consistent with the observations on the data set. Yeah, so we should get the same, the same label resulting from the classifier as the one we have observed in the examples. This assumption could be lifted in certain, in certain cases. Well, now, of course, one of the difficulties with this task is that the difficulty is not so much to find one classifier, but the difficulty is to find a good classifier, because in general you have many classifiers which are available. Let me look at this small example. So we have a number of patients. Some of them are sick, let's say, and some of them are not sick. Yeah? So they are red or blue. These are their attributes. Yeah, different measures or, or different observations of different uh, attributes. And this doctor F has come up with a classification rule which coincides perfectly with the one given by the, by the examples. So his rule is to say simply that we should just check how many attributes take value 1. And if at least three of the attributes take value 1, then the output should be 1. Let's say the patient is sick. So this is a classification rule which is perfectly coherent with the examples, but Dr. G has a different rule, not a different opinion, but he has come up with a different rule, which says that in fact we should compute x1 plus 2x2 because x2 is an important attribute. x3 uh, is totally irrelevant, and if we do x1 plus 2x2 plus x4 and the sum is larger than uh, 3, then we should say that the patient is sick. And again, this rule is perfectly coherent with the observations. And on the other hand, here come two different patients, two new patients we had not seen before. And according to the rule that Dr. F is applying, then the first one is not sick and the second one is sick. And according to Dr. G, it's just the, the inverse that happens. Yeah? So in, in general, you need somehow you need a tool or you need a criterion to decide what is a good classification rule and what is not a good classification rule. I'll come back to this, uh, to this question. But let me now restrict my attention to a very specific setting which will be described in my terminology by partially defined Boolean functions. So the setting is the following. I'm going to assume that, just as in the example, in fact, all the attributes are simply binary attributes, 0 or 1. So you observe or you do not observe an attribute in, a, in, a, in each example. And, uh, and the output is again 0 or 1. So we have a classification into two classes. Well, if we look at th this framework, then what we are given as input is a set of uh, true points, which is a subset of all possible 0, 1 points, and a set of false points, which is a subset of all possible 0, 1 points. I'm going to assume, remember what I said before, I'm going to assume that these two sets are disjoint. Again, I could lift this hypothesis in, in certain settings, but here I'm going to assume that they are disjoint. And this, I'm going to call this pair TF, I'm going to call it a partially defined Boolean function. And this is a, a, a concept which has been well known in the Boolean function literature for many years, at least more than 60 years. Yeah? It's a concept which has been studied, for instance, investigated in depth in the electrical engineering literature. Because in electrical engineering, what you want in general is to design a circuit, for instance, which responds, which reacts in a certain way on certain inputs, which reacts in a different way on other inputs, and for most of the inputs, you just don't care how the circuit is going to react. So you have partial specifications of the, of the output that is going to produce on certain inputs. So this type of setting is, is very common in the electrical engineering literature, and it has been studied for a long time. Here I'm going to look at it as being the input of a classification problem. I have some partial information about a Boolean function but I don't know the complete Boolean function because I don't have a value for each possible 0, 1 point. So my job in this setting, the classification job, is to find what we are going to call an extension of TF, which is a Boolean function, which is consistent with the given examples. 
so such that all the, the true examples are true points of the function, all the false examples are false points of the function, and on the remaining points, I don't know. The Boolean function could take any value you want. So let me look at all these possible extensions, which are classifiers, actually. Let me look at all these possible extensions. And it's a simple observation to see that there are many possible extensions in general. Well, you have 2 to the n possible uh, 0, 1 points, 2 to the n vertices of the hypercube. I'm giving a value or I'm imposing the value of this number of points. These are the, the examples that I've seen. And for all the other points, I can give value 0, 1 to get an extension. So I have this many possible extensions of a given data set. And in general, t and f are going to be very small as compared to, to 2 to the n. So if, if you have 20 attributes, for instance, and if you have seen 1,000 examples, which is a lot, which is much more than what you would have in a medical application, for instance, in practice, then you still have this number of possible extensions. So clearly, you need to be able to sort out what are the good extensions from the bad ones. And what will be the criteria? This is where I'm coming back to some of the questions that have been discussed by, uh, by you this morning. Um, well, I may be interested in having a simple extension. Simple in some sense. Yeah? Uh, simple because it, uh, it only relies on some essential attributes. Simple because it can be computed efficiently when I need it. Yeah. Uh, I may be interested in, again, something which has been mentioned this morning as well, I may be interested in classifiers, extensions, which, are, which can be interpreted, yeah, which I can explain somehow. I can be interested in uh, extensions which are justifiable, which is slightly different. Here I can explain my rules. Here I can justify why I'm using those rules. Um, and I could also do all kinds of statistical testing to see whether, in the sense, in the sense that you were discussing this morning, to see whether I'm sort of minimizing some loss function. Yeah. Notice that I'm going to, to focus again in this talk on what I'm calling here unspecified models, meaning that uh, I'm not going to assume much about the functional forms of the function that I'm trying to, to find, for instance. It's not entirely true, but I'm not going to make many assumptions about the form of the, of the extensions. And I'm not going to assume that I'm trying to find a, a monotone extension, for instance, or, or that the, the extension has any specified properties. But Andre will come back to these questions, or to some of these, uh, this afternoon. So how can we build a reasonable extension? Well, there are many ways which are well known in the in the machine learning literature. So let me just uh, show you a couple of these. Nearest neighbor methods, how do they work in general? Probably most of you know this. We are going to define a, a notion of distance in the space of, a, of a possible observations. And uh, these are the examples I've seen. I've seen red points and blue points. You give me a new point. Well, I'm just going to check how close this point is to each of the blue points and red points. And then based on this distance measure that I have adopted, I will say, well, this point, it happens to be closest to a blue point or to the blue points. So I'm going to call it blue yeah? because it's, closest, it's closer to the blue set than to the red set in some sort of a measure. If you look at the Boolean framework, there is a very natural way of doing this. These are the examples I've seen. Now I would like to classify a new point. So you give me the point 111, for instance. And I'm, where is 111? Oh, it is here. So 111 in the Boolean hypercube, if you look at the natural Hamming distance, the distance along the edges. Yeah? Uh, 111 is closer to red points than to blue points, so I'm going to call it red. And 000 is closer to 0, 0 is closer to a blue point than to a red point, so I'm going to call it blue. Yeah. This is nearest distance in the Boolean framework, or a natural extension, let's say. 
Let me turn to decision trees quickly. Again, you are, most of you are probably familiar with this. In the Boolean framework, decision trees have been extremely well studied. So this is how I could build a decision tree. I'm going to look at the set of examples I have, blue points, red points. And I'm going to say, well, let's take an arbitrary variable, x1, for instance, in my case. And let's distinguish between the points where x1 is 0 and the points where x1 is 1. So I have some examples on the left, some examples on the right. And all the examples on the left are blue. Yeah? I've not seen any red point which has a 0 as a first value, as a value of the first attribute. So I'm going to stop here on the left branch and say, well, if I see that x1 is equal to 0 in any future example, I'm just going to call it blue. Yeah. On the right, I still have some, um, some um, inconsistency or um, uncertainty about the classification because I have blue points and red points where x1 is 1. So I'm going to branch further. I'm going to look at a second attribute x2 in this case. On the left side, if x2 is 0, I could still see blue points or red points. On the right side, I only see red points. So any point which has 1 for x1 and 1 for x2, I will call it red from here on. Yeah. And so on. So I get to the end of my classification. Each node, each leaf is pure in the sense of decision trees. It only has red points or blue points. And this can be used as a classifier for future examples. If you give me any point, I'm just going to check is x1 0 or 1. If x1 is 1, I go down this branch. Is x2 0 or 1, I go down this branch if it is 0, and then I end up here. I, I call it blue. Yeah. So a decision tree can be used as a classifier. What's interesting is that from a decision tree, it's sort of easy to reproduce, to create the disjunctive normal form of a function which is representing this decision tree in the following sense. I'm just going to look at the blue leaves, this one and this one, and say, okay, this leaf is characterized by the fact that x1 is 0. So I'm going to put x1 bar here. x1 bar should be 1, meaning that x1 should be 0. And this blue leaf is characterized by the fact that x1 is 1, x2 is 0, x3 is 0. So I write x1, x2 bar, x3 bar, which represents exactly this leaf. And this is a disjunctive normal form representing the blue function, if you want. So the set of points where this decision tree is going to give a value blue 1 to the function. And I could do the same for the red part, actually. <coughs> so I could look at the red nodes and say, well, this is uh, 1, 0, 1. Where am I? 1, 0, 1. So 1, 0, 1. So this node, is represent, this node is represented by this term, and this node 1, 1 is represented by x1, x2. And so this disjunctive normal form takes value 1 exactly in, these, in the points which end up in these red leaves. So you get easily the disjunctive normal form which is associated with a decision tree. I will also come back to this point. Notice that this classifier is not the same as the, as the one I obtained through nearest neighbor. You can, some points are classified differently by the two classifiers. And finally, I could use other types of, um, of separators as well. This is basically what you do with neural networks. You're just going to check whether the blue points can be separated from the red points by a hyperplane, which means a linear separator. That can be done easily by linear programming. I'm not going to, to, to develop this, but it's easy to see that you are just looking for a, well, a hyperplane separating two sets of points. So this is an LP problem. And for those of you who have an interest in, a, in game theory, this is perfectly equivalent to recognizing whether a game given by a set of winning coalitions and losing coalitions is a weighted uh, majority game. It's the same question, actually. OK, so this was the framework somehow. So let me turn to logical analysis of data, which is a technique, let me call it technique for the time being, which was introduced uh, 26 years ago in a paper by, that I wrote with Peter Hammer and, uh, and Toshi Ibaraki. And uh, 
It's not really a mathematical theory. I would not like to call this a mathematical theory. It's, it's, it's almost a bag of tricks. Yeah? It's a bag of tricks which is based on the fact that we want to look at classification problems as being part of Boolean theory somehow. And we want to work in a Boolean framework in order to develop classifiers. And it's based also on a collection of concepts, algorithms, and structural properties about which I'm going to tell you a few things. <coughs> we will be working with representations of extensions by disjunctive normal forms, not by decision trees, not by linear separators, not by distance functions, but by disjunctive normal forms. So it is our aim to produce disjunctive normal forms. And we will be working essentially with uh, three basic ideas, which is a selection of relevant variables, selection of relevant terms that we call patterns, and selection of relevant disjunctions of terms, so DNFs that we will call theories, which should explain the data. So there are similarities between this approach and many other things which have been studied in, uh, in the literature under different names in different fields. Um, from that point of view, probably we cannot claim much originality for the concepts. So what makes probably the method interesting is the, the fact that it works, it can be used in many types of concepts. It has many, many generalizations in different concepts when you have missing data, when you have errors and so on, when you have numerical data. So it can be extended in many ways. And this paper alone is cited a few hundred times in the literature. So it has attracted some, some attention clearly in the literature, uh, whatever uh, Tony can, can tell us about uh, the, the value of citations. Somehow this should, this type of approaches has attracted some attention. So let me tell you about the, these basic building blocks that we are using and what are the basic ideas that are hiding behind logical analysis of data. So the first one is a common idea again in, in a data mining or in machine learning. We would like to select relevant attributes. In many applications that have been studied using logical analysis of data, we have hundreds or thousands of attributes sometimes. For instance, in medical applications, there are many tests which are conducted automatically, simply, and you get lots of data which can be relevant or not relevant. In many cases, the doctors or the biologists do not know whether a certain attribute will be relevant in order, on, in order to predict a certain disorder. So they just collect the data and give it to you. So one of, our goal is, one of our goals is to select relevant features. And the second goal is to compress data. So what do I mean by this? Relevance, well, relevance is well defined and well studied for Boolean functions. Relevance of attributes is a concept which has been studied at length, actually, for Boolean functions. It, uh, for Boolean functions, we say that an attribute or a variable is relevant if, by changing its value, you can change the output of the function in at least one point. Yeah? If that does not happen, then it means that the variable is totally irrelevant. So in that framework, it's a well understood concept. And actually, there are many measures of the relevance of a variable. And these measures have been developed for many, many years in different settings, in game theory, for instance, in electrical engineering, in uh, voting systems. These measures of relevance of, of variables have been well studied. Uh, I should mention reliability probably in different fields as well. And some of you have worked with similar examples, similar uh, notions as well, actually. Now, when you work with partially defined Boolean functions, it's a different story. So it's much more difficult to understand what are relevant attributes and what are not relevant attributes. There is this, uh, this old paper by now, 20 years old, which covers uh, some of the concepts that uh, that have been used and they are not coherent somehow. You see that there are many ways of looking at relevant attributes. Data compression is a slightly different idea. The idea is that in most cases when we do classification, we would like to have a model which is as simple as possible. We know that we can do overfitting easily. So in principle or in practice, we would like to have models which do not involve too many variables so that they remain reasonably simple. And uh, one of the objectives is also to decrease the, 
the computational complexity of, of using the classifier simply, and in particular, again, if you want to, to work on a real application, the collection of, uh, of future data has a cost in general. And again, in the medical applications that I was mentioning, they may provide you with a lot of data in general, but if they have to collect this data for a specific patient, this has a cost which can be measured in, in euros or in human costs sometimes. So you don't want to have too many attributes in your models for different reasons. Now, yeah, uh, the way we look at this in, uh, in logical analysis of data is mostly based on this type of idea. We would like to find a small set of attributes which is able to distinguish, to separate the true points from the false points in the data set. So what do I mean by this? It's again an old idea. You have a set of data, a data set which looks like this, many attributes. But in fact, if I just want to know whether a point is true or false, I just need to look at these attributes, the red ones. And if you look at the values of the attributes on these, the values of the variables on, on this, the first one, the fourth one, the seventh one, if I know that I, I have one, 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 then it's enough to know that I have a true point because I've never seen one, one, one in a false point. If I only take the first two red uh, attributes, then this is not a support set in the sense uh, that I'm discussing now because when I see um, zero, zero, for instance, uh, well, I see it in true points, I see it in false points, so giving me the value of these two attributes is not sufficient to distinguish between true points and false points. But if you give me, on the data set, on the data set, if you give me the value of these three attributes, then I have enough information to distinguish. So this is what we call a support set. And in general, we would like to be able to find a small support set of attributes. It's again a problem that has been looked at from different angles in the literature. There are many, many techniques which are, which are used to do this. Actually, when you build a decision tree, the decision tree is selecting attributes in a certain way, according to certain criteria, and the decision tree is trying to end up with a small set of attributes in general. Now, the way we do it in LAD is that we look at a set covering model, and the set covering model is telling us, the variables of the set covering model are telling us, should we keep an attribute, yes or no? And the constraints are that for each pair of true point and false point, we should select at least one of the attributes which distinguishes between the true point and the false point. <coughs> so the number of constraints is roughly the square of the number of observations. You know, that's the order. So you have many, many constraints, but not that many. And you can solve, if you are trying to minimize the number of attributes that you are selecting, you can solve this type of models either by exact methods or by approximate methods. There are many good algorithms for set covering problems. So this is the basic idea, and again, there are many refine, refinements and generalizations and uh, more subtle ways of implementing this, but even this basic idea works reasonably well, actually. Now, you may say, okay, still, why do we want a small set? Do we, do we really want a small set of features? Should we look for the smallest set of attributes that constitutes a support set? Again, it's a very broad question. You may wonder how you could measure the quality of a support set. <coughs> we are just looking for a small one. Is that really reasonable? Well, typically there may be many support sets. No? There will be many support sets actually in a, in a given, for a given data set. And the idea that is underlying the criterion that we are using is that if you have a very large data set if you have a very large data set, then you are unlikely to find a small support set. In particular, if you wanted to generate a lot of random data yeah, and label the, the examples blue and red and look for a small support set, if you have a lot of data, in general, you will not find a small support set. You will, you will need a reasonably large support set if the data is random. So if you just reverse this reasoning, we could say that if you find a small support set in a large data set, it probably means that you have found something which is significant, which is meaningful. Yeah? 
because in a large in a large data set you should not have a small support set. If you, if you find one, it should have some meaning somehow. So that's the underlying intuition, which is not a CRM in any way. Yeah? It's the underlying intuition to use this kind of, um, of support sets. And it, again, it has been proved. I will not show you many, many computational results, but it has been shown to work well in many, many cases. And of course, if you don't have a, a data set which is meaningful, then you should not try to analyze it using a classifier, probably. You're just, just analyzing noise. OK, let me turn to patterns, which are the main building blocks probably in this, uh, in this approach. So remember that the term is just an elementary conjunction. It's expressing a, a combination of conditions on, on Boolean variables. Now, what we call a pattern for a given set of examples, true and false examples, is just a conjunction which, let me read the sentence, it's probably easier, which has been observed once, so a combination of, of values which has been observed once in a true point and never in a false point. So it's a term which takes value 1 for at least one true example and which takes value 0 for all the false examples. <coughs> Let me show you on this small data set again. This is my data set. Let's say that all the attributes are relevant. These are some patterns. x1, x2 is a pattern. Why? Because I've seen x1, x2 in some blue points. And I've never seen x1, x2 equal to 1. I've never seen 1, 1 in any red point. So this seems to be somehow characteristic, indicative of, of being a blue point. x2, x3 bar, meaning that x2 is 1 and x3 is 0 x2 is 1, x3 uh, is 0, has been seen in a blue point, has never been seen in a red point. And so on, x2, x4. And I could do the same for the red points. I could say for the red points, I've seen x1 is 0, x2 is 0, like here, in a red point. I've never seen it in a blue point. So these we call patterns or co-patterns. And again, they are similar to objects that are used in other types of data mining techniques. And in general, there will be many patterns, of course. Yeah? Many patterns, many co-patterns for a given data set. So we still have the problem of deciding how we are going to use them somehow. So of, of, of doing pattern generation. Now, notice that not all patterns are born equal. So for instance, if I look at this pattern, x2, x4, I would say that for this example, it's a pretty good pattern because not only do I see it once in a blue point, but x2, x4, I see it twice in a blue point. This is what we call the coverage of the pattern. So we have seen this combination, x2 is 1, x4 is 1. We have seen it in many examples, somehow, two. Yeah. Two out of three in this example. And I could compute different types of uh, quality indicators of a, of a pattern, like precision or so on. Now, if we generate patterns, what we would like to do in practice is to generate all patterns, perhaps, so that we have a large collection of patterns at our disposal. Well, it's possible in a sense. It is possible, it's been proved, that you can generate all patterns efficiently, meaning in total polynomial time. But I'm not going to insist on this if you don't know what is the... The concept, so somehow, theoretically, you can generate all the patterns efficiently. But still, there are many patterns in general for a large data set, so you don't want to generate all the patterns in practice. And uh, so perhaps we should try to concentrate on the patterns which have a high coverage in this, oops, a high coverage in this sense, yeah? meaning that they cover many blue points. So we may want to generate all the patterns which have a coverage at least a fraction of the true points, fraction gamma. And again, this problem turns out to be difficult. It's actually, uh, it's actually an NP-hard problem. OK, so we'll have to do this empirically. Now let me turn to theories. Now, an extension. Remember, an extension is just a Boolean function which extends in the natural way the given data set. An extension is called a theory in our terminology. 
if it can be represented as a disjunction of patterns. So it will be a Boolean function because it will, it will, I will get a disjunctive normal form which represents a certain Boolean function. And this should be, we insist that it should be a disjunction of some patterns. So you can view it as a, a disjunction of patterns which cover all the true points of the, of the function, or if you want, a, a collection of subcubes in the Boolean cube which, cover, which covers all the blue points, all the true points of the given data set. So this is what we call a, a theory, and this is the type of classifiers we are interested in building. And a theory of, of the inverse of the symmetric data set, if I, if I permute the roles of f and t, a theory for this data set is now, a, it's now an extension for the false points if you want, and we call it a co, a co theory. So it's a, it's a Boolean function which extends the negative observations, the zero observations. Okay, so I will use not much, but I will use these notations. These are all the series, all the extensions which are series of the data set, and all the extensions which are series of the permuted data set. Now, what's interesting is that you may say, well, we have not, not moved much as compared to the initial description, which was the initial description of the problem was find an extension, a Boolean extension of the given data set. But actually, the number of series in this sense is much, much smaller than the number of extensions. So actually, by doing this, we are restricting very much the, the, the possible field of uh, extensions that we are looking at. So looking at series is not, is not, uh, is not a neutral option, let's say. It has implications on the fact that you are restricting yourself. And in this sense, I was saying earlier that I'm doing unsupervised classification, that I don't really have a model in mind. Well, it's not really true, because this is our model, somehow. Yeah. Let me show you an example again. So back to this smaller data set. These were patterns. There are many more patterns that you may generate. And this is a theory. So x1, x2, or x2, x4. What does it mean that it is a, a theory? First of all, it's a disjunction of patterns, x1, x2, x2, x4. And x1, x2, x2, x4 covers all the blue points. So the first blue point is covered by x2, x4 being 1, which is this. The second blue point is covered by x2, x4, which is 1. And the third one is covered by x1, x2, r1, which is this. So this is covering all the blue points. And it's not going to take value 1 on any red point, because that's how I defined the patterns. And I can do the same for the red points. I can do the same for a co, co theory. Now, let me see what I have on my next slide. Well, let me, let me tell you perhaps at this point why we are interested in this kind of classifiers. And again, I will come back to it. If somebody comes to me with a new point, a new observation, and asks me, is this a blue point or a red point? I'm going to look at it. I'm going to check the value of this function. And the function will say, it's 1. Function takes value 1. So I say it's a blue point. And the person who came to me asks me why. And I say, well, it's a blue point. I'm going to classify this new observation as being blue because, because x1, x2 is 1. Because x1, x2 is 1, and x1, x2 equal to 1, I have seen it in some blue points before, and I have never seen it in any red point. So I have some sort of explanation yeah. to give to my, now whether you find it convincing or not is a different story. Yeah? But at least I have some sort of justification to say this is why I'm classifying this point as being a blue point. I've seen previous examples somehow. Now you can see that if I have patterns which have a high coverage, meaning that I've seen this combination very often in the blue points, then my argument is even more convincing. I can say, well, I've seen this combination 25 times in, a, in a sick patients. I've never seen it in any healthy patient. <laughs> so I have this notion of justifiability somehow, which goes with the use of patterns. 
and which is not always present in all, in all methods that are used in data mining. Typically, in neural networks, you don't have much explanation going, going with a method. Moreover, not only is this type of, um, of classifier justifiable, but it's also interpretable. So I can tell a doctor, look, probably this sickness or this illness is associated with the presence of these two attributes simultaneously. So this is easy to explain, or these two simultaneously. And when a patient is healthy, it means that uh, probably he does not have X1 and he does not have X4. So you have rules which are easy to explain because each term expresses a simple condition somehow. So you have both this uh, simplicity, interpretability, and justifiability. So that's why we like these, um, these type of classifiers. Perhaps it's not that needed if you are just looking at developing an automated classification tool, but if you want to work in applications where the, the users are very much in demand of explanations, as again in the medical field, then this is a very, very important property. Let me look again at this nearest neighbor classifier that I was showing before. No. Actually, this nearest neighbor classifier, if I compute it completely, which I'm not going to do, if I compute completely what is the Boolean extension which is defined by the nearest neighbor classifier, then it can be represented as in this form, and this is actually a theory in our sense. So the nearest neighbor is building, in this case, it's building a theory in our sense. And if I look at the decision trees, then again, this function, this blue function, which is represented by the decision tree, is a theory in our sense. And the red one is a co-theory in our sense. Well, notice actually that the red in this decision tree, the red function is just the negation of the blue one because the point is either red or blue, and this is partitioning completely the set. Yeah. So this one is really the negation of this one. A point is red if it is not blue, yeah. if and only if it is not blue. So how can we, let me come back to this, how can we explain that we like to use a plus, these series, well, we like them because they are justifiable and not G certifiable. Justifiable. Um, notice that typically, and this is what was discussed this morning in, in learning, in machine learning, you would justify somehow the choice of a classifier by checking that it works well on a given data set or on given data sets. This is the typical way you do it. And you can do it either experimentally or more theoretically by assuming that you have a certain distribution of examples, for instance. So this is typically what is done in, uh, in order to, to justify the choice of a, certain, of a certain theory. Now, again, this is what I was discussing before. In our case, we can justify the use of a classifier, or we can justify a classification, more exactly, based on the fact that we have patterns, and on the fact that an example is classified as true or false, blue or red, because some of the patterns is triggering. So we have this intuitive justification of the use of a, of a classifier. But notice that if we have a classifier which extends, so a theory which extends the blue points, let's say, then it does not necessarily provide a good, good classification or a good justification for the red points. The patterns that we use in a theory do not tell us anything about the red points. They just tell us something about the blue points. So this is a bit of a shortcoming somehow. If we use a, a theory like this, we don't necessarily have a good justification for, for classifying a point as being a false point. We only have a justification for classifying it, classifying it as a blue point. On the other hand, we can build a theory for the red points. So we end up with having a justification for saying that the point is blue and another classifier which provides a justification for saying that the point is red. And ideally what we would like to have is a, is a, 
a pair of classifiers, one for the blue points, one for the red points, which are coherent and exhaustive. Yeah. So somehow we would like to have a pair of classifiers F and G, <coughs> F and G, which are complementary to each other, which are the negations of each other, so that the point is red if and only if it is not blue, and in both cases we have justification provided by the, by the patterns which go with it. And you may ask, well, is this always possible? And the answer is, yes, it is always possible. So I, we can always find series such that their negation is a series for the, for the other set of points. So we can always find a series for the blue points somehow, so that its negation is a series for the red points. So we have justifiability in both cases. And actually, so the answer is yes. And actually, all decision trees provide series which are by series, so which provide simultaneously justification in my sense for blue points and red points. And almost all nearest neighbor classifiers are also providing series which are such that their complement is simultaneously a co-series. So you get justification for blue, cl uh, blue classification and red classification. But there are by series which are not decision trees and which are not nearest neighbor classifiers. So we have a broader class. Okay, so in practice, when this has been implemented, uh, this type of approaches has been implemented in several software packages. Um, we can build series by selecting enough patterns to cover all the positive examples. This can be done using some sort of optimization criterion, which expresses simplicity. Again, there are many, many applications in the literature. You mentioned this morning that when you speak of machine learning, you should have at least one table about results. So this is one set of examples which have been solved using very simple classifiers based on logical analysis of data. Simple in the sense that we restricted ourselves to at most five patterns. So we have DNFs consisting of five terms at most, very simple ones. And you can see that uh, for all these, uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the experimentation, but for all these data sets, which are classical ones, we get very good classification results, very good precision on the training set, and very good precision on the testing set as well. So the, these classifiers work well, even with very few patterns, even very short classifiers. Conclusions, I'm done. Um, I did not discuss this in detail, but actually it's sort of surprising that even a single, a single pattern in many cases is already a very good classifier for most, most uh, data sets we know. So you can get very, very simple and very robust classifiers. If you use disjunction of good patterns, you get classifiers which are good for a large variety of applications. I don't want to enter a competition. I'm simply claiming that it works well in many cases. We have classifications which are understandable and justifiable. And in our sense, this is the main important point, probably perhaps more important than than the accuracy somehow in many cases. Um, this has been used in many types of applications, medical sector, prediction of earthquakes, many other applications, especially in the, in the biomedical field. This technique or this approach seems to work very well. There are extensions to data sets with missing data, data sets with uh, errors, data sets using numerical attributes. So there are all kinds of extensions of this approach, this general bag of tricks, as I called it before. And uh, there are a few software packages which have been developed. These are some of the basic references, and uh, there are many more papers on this. Thanks.